I had in my hand the mission's pledge card. And this mes- mission's pledge card is for you to take home and pray over it. You, your family, and ask the Lord to place a number in your heart where you can give financially to our missionaries. There's two ways that you can pledge. One is by giving an end-of-the-year gift, a one-time gift. The last Sunday of November, we're going to be taking up that special collection for our missionaries. Or you can decide to give every month in the year 2023, throughout the whole year, because we send out our missions support pledges every month to our missionaries so we could support their families and the work that they do in these different regions around the world. As of right now, China is the only uh, continent that we do not directly support missionaries, and we need to pray that the Lord provides um, that opportunity. Um, Many of the, the works that we support are not necessarily missionaries that came from the United States, but they may be native to that particular region or country, and they were raised up. And because of limited resources in areas in the mountains of El Salvador, maybe in the poorer parts of Colombia, what we do is we are piping in financial resources because we live in the United States of America where we are blessed. We're a rich nation. And it's our joy and it's our blessing to support these great works, especially where there are indigenous peoples who have received the gospel and are reaching their own people. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Church, we give over $50,000 a year to missions. You divide that up over the course of a year, and that's somewhere between four and 5,000 a month that just goes straight out of our church budget. And that's a blessing. So every year, back in the day, we would have a big winter festival. The first Sunday of every December, we would have a massive food um, festival where our ministries of our church would make food that represented the different nations around the globe. And then we would then allow people to purchase raffle, uh, excuse me, purchase tickets for food. And then we'd have special songs, special occasion, and it was a wonderful time of celebration. Well, three years ago, we entered into a pandemic. We weren't able to do the festival. And so for the last several years, we've been kind of in, on hiatus in that regard. So last year, we decided to dedicate a whole month to missions to bring a greater awareness and not just one Sunday of the year. And then we allowed the church to be a part of a yearly pledge. And then we instituted last year the raffle um, opportunities. And when we had the, the winter festival, you guys, we would raise anywhere between eight to $14,000 on that one particular Sunday. And then people gave to missions every month throughout the year. Well, last year when we weren't able to do the, the winter festival, but we had dedicated in our heart and spoke as a church leadership team and our church board and... Um, and the pastoral staff, we all agreed that we needed to do something. So our executive team came together and we dreamt up the month of missions. Well, wouldn't you know that last year we raised close to $30,000 to support our missionaries. So we were able to raise almost quadruple of, of the amount that we did in prior years with the Winter Festival. So we decided we wanted to continue to work and operate in that same vein. Look at today, our children having a tangible expression and an activity that they're never going to forget. That there are missionaries and people around the world that are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and extending the hands and feet of Jesus and meeting people right where they are. Now in Sunday school, they're going to be hearing stories about missionaries that have reached far and distant lands with the message of Jesus. And we want to continue to support our directors, Jackie and Primo Cortez, that have taken up the mantle and that are taking our missions. How many of you have have felt that they have taken that mantle and have, have raised that standard and that level here at the church? 
Thank you guys and keep up the great work. We're so thankful for both of you. So church, please take this home, grab a magnet, place it on your refrigerator because everybody eats and pray over that every day and ask the Lord how you might join your church as we give 100% of our missions proceeds go directly to missions. Oh, and by the way, three weeks ago when we took up the offering to help the family in Florida that lost their home in Hurricane Ian, we raised $2,300 and the church is sending $2,500 to that family, the Alicea family. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, church. You have always been so generous. If it's your first time here at Mission Ebenezer, you came on a good Sunday. You came on a good Sunday because you are witnessing and are experiencing worship here at its best. We're a loving church. We're a generous church. And we're a missions church that has a heart for Jesus. You know, in the last 50 years or so, the, the Christian faith has really taken a lot of heat and a lot of flack for what missionaries have been criticized for doing in the last 300 years around the world. It was not the intentions of missionaries, whether Catholic or Protestant, to impose their cultural traditions upon unreached nations with the gospel. But subsequent to missionaries being launched from places like the United States of America or Europe or the Western world, missionaries have also mixed in the gospel message of Jesus Christ with an imposition of their own culture and their own way of life, taking the suit and tie to places in indigenous parts of the world. And in some ways, making people think that to receive Jesus, you had to become some different form of a civilized person or Christian. When that is not the message of the gospel at all. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we, we have a God who decided to create humanity so that we would worship him and live in a relationship of worship and praise. And through that purpose, we would be in the loving relationship. And we all know because of free will, Adam and Eve fell. And in their falling, in original sin, there was a conversation in heaven where Jesus, the Son of God, said, send me. I will go to them, and I will be the sacrifice to reconcile humankind to Almighty God. So Jesus was our first missionary. He was incarnational. The root for, word for incarnational is carne, which means he took on flesh. Anybody like carne asada? That's sliced meat. Well, I'm using that illustration only to push the fact that Jesus took on flesh. He resided here on this earth and pitched his tent to dwell among us. And Jesus reconciled human, humankind to Father God. And when it was time for Jesus to go, Jesus went to the cross. He rose again on the third day. He said it was finished. And then he says, now I will impart to you the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 26. It says, and I will send you my spirit. And he will bring all things to remembrance for you. You guys, we, we have been given the Holy Spirit who remains as a missionary to us. If anybody has received Jesus and has been reconciled to God, the Spirit of Christ lives in you. The Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. 
That means the Holy Spirit is bringing to our conscience, you guys, a way of life that is bringing awareness and attention to the love that God has for all the world. And the Holy Spirit was given to us so that he would empower us with the message of Jesus so that we would go and reach the world with that message. And that was the church. The empowered church by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says that, and you will receive power and you will take this message of Jesus Christ to Jerusalem, Samaria, no, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And set the church in motion on a trajectory. Historically, here we are. 2,000 years later, and the church is still being the missional Christ to the world. Not that our faith or our religion is better than anybody else's. Not that we're right and others are wrong. It's not a message that if you don't receive, if you don't receive what I'm telling you, you're going straight to hell. Guys, part of our responsibility is allowing people to see that maybe the expression of Christianity or the, Christian, the expression of faith that others have seen or experienced may not have been what God intended for those people to see and to experience. Because people are pushing away the message of Jesus left and right and all over the place. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And so as we are going to be focusing, focusing on missions this whole month, I want us to think about who God is to us. Who is God to you? What has God been to you? What has Jesus been to you? Is Jesus just a good luck charm? Because if that's said, guess what? You're going to be a missionary to the world and teach the world that God's all about good luck. You just pray to him before a game and ask for a couple of touchdowns or a home run or a goal or a few baskets. Remember when I was a kid, I had a very immature faith, and I used to go down the line, and I used to pray that God would help me, help me uh, do all those kind of things until the Lord taught me and showed me what my faith was really all about. Father, help me to play to the best of my abilities, protect my body, but also give us victory. And at the end of the game, Lord, thank you for today because this is a game after all. So church, missions. It begins with God. It continues through the, his son, Jesus, who is also God in the flesh. Then the Holy Spirit was given to us and the, the spirit of missions continued. Then the church received the great commission to go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So what's left? You, who are a visible expression of the church, are meant to also be missional. Turn to your neighbor and say, God has called you to be missional. Turn to your other neighbor, your second choice, and tell them God is calling you to be missional. Missional means that you represent Christ in the dynamic of going to, reaching people, not waiting for people to come to you, but you going to them. We are a missional church, and God's calling you to be a, a missional believer. God's calling you to pray about how you can subtly begin to walk that walk with him and demonstrate the love of Christ through your life. Yeah. One of the ways that we decided as a church to be missional was to build a community center right here. 36,000 square foot warehouse where we have boxing, a weight room, batting cages, a skate park, where we could reach youngsters from the neighborhood and all around the South Los Angeles region, getting youngsters off the streets, out of gangs, off of drugs, out of jail, and out of the grave. And introduce these young people and these families to Jesus. So the Lord 
through our tithes and our offerings, keeps that community center reaching thousands of people every week. Guys, we're this close from receiving a $20,000 grant to help us improve that facility over there. Would you join me in prayer? Would you join me in prayer for that? And our boxing coach and his wife, Coach Elvis and Olivia. God's moving through the pandemic. We, turned, we brought the boxing program out here under the tent because we knew a whole bunch of youngsters weren't staying at home in quarantine. They were out on the streets that summer of 2020. We said, not on our watch. Not on our watch. The world of the message, the, the, the message of the world is trying to capture our young men, our young women's minds, and lead them far, 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 far away from Jesus. We're not going down without a fight. We're not going down without a fight. Right. Come on, Sister Lydia. So five generations ago, my great-great-grandparents on my mom's side were pastors in a little small town called Warren, Ohio. They were pastors of a Pentecostal church. And my great-great-grandfather was walking in the grass beneath the tree. And my great-grandfather was up in the tree. He was a kid, and he had just climbed the tree. And while my great-great-grandfather, Wagner, was walking there, talking about the great need for a region of the world called India that was unreached with the gospel of Jesus Christ, my great-grandfather, Harry Wagner, responded to God's call upon his life when he was just a kid. And he had promised the Lord Jesus that he would be a missionary to India. When he became a young man, he got married and married a woman named Helen. And they left it, Darjeeling, India. And they ministered to a, a village that was filled with people who had leprosy. And all 13 of their children were born there in India, my grandmother included, Grandma Beatrice Wagner. My mom's home smelled like parata and chutney and curry and all kinds of good stuff because that's all my grandmother and her family made and ate. And they were from the United States of America. My grandmother's skin was white as the snow. But they, my mom grew up with that Indian culture and heritage. And it was wonderful. To this day, our family loves those kinds of smells and those kinds of things. And it reminds us of how God has called our family to the work of Jesus. Amen. I'm a missionary. I've always been a missionary. I'm a city missionary. Mine and Boomy's cars have constantly been filled with kids as we bring them back and forth to church. When the kids were young, we used to load up our cars. And kids would put tears in my leather car seats because we would be shuttling the kids back and forth to church. Because we believe so much in the significance of what the gospel means. Not that we're better and not that we're right and not that we're looking down on anybody at all. But just like my grand, grandmother who was raised in Darjeeling, India, simply to bring the gospel, and I'm sure there were probably some missteps too that my great-grandparents made not fully understanding all the, the cultural ramifications, right, of what it meant to bring the gospel to a, a foreign place like Darjeeling, India. But the love of Jesus could not be denied. The way they loved the people there in India and ministered to the lepers, knowing that they could also possibly fatally contract leprosy. Amen. They remained committed committed there's a story in the bible that is going to connect this brief illustration that i'm sharing with you about my grandparents harry and helen wagner you could type in their names on the internet and you'll find all kinds of stories that were written about the work that they did on behalf of jesus christ in india they're heroes of the faith well in second kings chapter 7 
Open your Bibles and turn with me, please. There was a famine in Samaria. Any of you know about the Bible, know that the, Samar the Samaritans or those who were in Samaria were considered half Jewish and half Gentile. They had intermarried and they had quote unquote mixed blood or mixed culture and not considered pure Jewish. This part of Samaria at this point in time was under attack and had been besieged by the Arameans. And in 2 Kings chapter 7, which is called one of the historical books of the Bible, is going to share with us a story about a group of lepers. A group of lepers who lived outside the city that had been besieged. You see, the Arameans, what they had done was they had closed off all the gates and they had restricted food from entering into the city. They had restricted people from coming out of the city. And so inside the city, people were suffering from famine. And then inside the city, they were dying of hunger. And when people start doing that, they start killing their babies, their young ones, or their sick and start to live in ways in you, that you and I never even want to have to think about or fathom. But look what it says here in 2 Kings chapter 7. Let's pick up in verse 3. If you have your Bible right there in 2 Kings 7, say amen. amen. Hopefully our text can put it up on the side walls. Those of you that don't have your Bible, you can follow along. But I want you to go back and I want you to read this whole story when you get home. It says this. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. And they said to each other, Why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we die. They're like, it doesn't seem like we have many options. Let's pick an option and let's go all in. How many saw LSU go for two yesterday against Alabama? We're all in. And they beat Alabama, the standard. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. And when they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. Nobody was at the camp of the Arameans. The Arameans was this group that had besieged Samaria, that had enclosed the city, that had prevented the, the, the people in this great city to not enter or leave, and they were dying inside the city. But when the lepers go to the Aramean camp and decide to go there and give it a chance and, and just give it a shot, they find that there's nobody in the camp. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there, for the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys, and they left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. So God had created a confusion in the Aramean camp to the extent that the Arameans flee and they just leave everything. I mean, their, 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 their greens were, were still boiling on the fire. Their, their carne asada was being cooked over here on this fire. And all of a sudden they heard this big massive noise that the Lord had caused and they just pick up and they left. Watch this. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, verse 8, and entered one of the tents. They ate and they drank and they carried away silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. You got, you got these lepers. And if you know anything about leprosy, it causes your, your extremities to fall off. Your, their ears would fall off as this disease would eat away at their flesh. Their fingers would start to fall off. Their lips would fall off. Anything that had cartilage, their nose would start to fall off and deteriorate and just get chewed up and massive sores and legions. And they had to 
bind themselves in, in gauze and wraps. And so they would walk around with their head covered and they would really look like mummies. They would really look like the walking dead. I'm serious. I'm just telling you that's how it was. And if, and if, and if leprosy, okay, if, if a skin cell had floated in the air, the skin cell could land upon somebody else's skin and that person could get leprosy. And so leopards could not, leopards, not leopards. They were spotted in a different way though. They had to live outside the city and could not live with their loved ones. And they had to walk around saying unclean, unclean, unclean. And people had to move out of the way as they would come through. They would have to clear the way so that they would not come in contact with anybody. So watch this. Can you imagine these four lepers that went and found and ate and they drank and they had all this good stuff. It says they walked away with gold and silver. They had, they had gold rings and they had, they had bling on you guys. They had, they had uh, some rings on their, their nubs for fingers as they were looking at each other. Like, can you believe this? Like we just struck gold. Their tummies were filled. They had plenty to drink. They had survived this, this great decision that they were making. Watch this. Hallelujah. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Then they said to each other, here it goes. Here it is. This is where it is. Somebody say missions is the heart of God. They said to each other. We are not doing right. This is a day of good news. Somebody say good news. And we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. Let's go back to the city where our loved ones are, where they're dying of famine. Where they think that they're still encircled by the Aramean enemy who really is not there. Let's tell them about what we had just discovered. So they went and called out to the city gatekeeper and told them, we went to the Aramean camp and not a man was there, not a sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents left just as they were. The gatekeeper shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. The king got up at night and said to the officers, I'll tell you what the Aramaeans have done to us. This, this king was wise. You know, when you have a lot to protect, you always have to be a couple steps ahead of everybody and you have to protect everything that you have. The more you have, the more you got to protect. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? They know we are starving, so they have left the camp to hide in the countryside thinking they will surely come out, and then we will take him alive and get into the city. So they're setting a trap for us. We're not going there. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, not so fast. That's what you thought. Eh? You remember that? You remember? One of his officers answered, have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plight will be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yes, they'll only be like all of the Israelites who are doomed. So let us send them to find out what has happened. So see, the king was still skeptical. So they selected two chariots with horses and the king sent them after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, go and find out what has happened. Somebody say, go. They followed him as far as the Jordan and they found the whole road strewn with the clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away in their headlong flight. So it was true. God had confused them and they were going to bring that message back to everybody there at the palace. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Aramaeans. So a sail of flour sold for a shekel and two sails of barley sold for a shekel as the Lord had said. So for me, you guys, this right here is a picture of, of why I believe missions is so important and so significant for us in the church and our faith. And it's not because we're better than anybody. 
It's not because we're taking our, our customs, our, our, our suits, and we're saying, hey, you want to be a Christian? You got to receive Jesus. And oh, yeah, by the way, you need to become civilized too. Terrible what the church has done to Native Americans. The oppression. The slavery. Forced, forced labor. Causing people to have to cut their hair and their traditions and their customs. And forgot that the whole point of the message was to bring people in a loving relationship into Jesus and not oppress them, not exploit them. Amen. But the point of the gospel, the good news, these lepers discovered right here. You guys, that we're seeing is that they're saying it is not right for us to hear, to eat and drink and to have everything that we can and not go back and tell our beloved brothers and sisters and our families about this goodness. You guys, the love that we have for God and the love that he has for us is the kind of love that should make you and I want to go and love others and share the love of Jesus with them. No strings attached. Oh, I know someone so good and so loving and so generous and so patient and so merciful and so gracious. And I just want you to know him, too. And his name is Jesus. Amen. And he is God and he's created all of this, but he's he's created it for us. But in the meantime, he wants us to also live in this relationship with him. Amen. You guys, what are you going to do with the plunder that is the gospel that you possess and that is it? in you that dwells in you with the, the, the message of Jesus that saves, that forgives, that convicts, that pardons you guys and that get, offers eternal life. What are we going to do with that message? That's the question. Where is your field? Where is your nation? Go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Where is your nation? Where is your ethnos? Where are your people? And when we understand who our people are, those are the folks that God says, yes, now bring me to them in the way, in the way that you are now understanding. You're a skateboarder? Take the message to the skateboarders over there. That's your ethnos. Because ethnos means massive group. Are you an athlete? Take the message to athletes. Your life should resemble a life of Christ where you're able to take that message to your world, to your nation. My brother David, some of you guys know, he coaches for the Seattle Seahawks. They play at 1 o'clock today going to keep the Seahawk train going. Choo-choo. Guess what? Guess what, you guys? 14 years ago, he used to be our worship pastor. Came to my dad and said, Daddy, I don't think I'm supposed to be the worship pastor anymore. What, son? All three of you boys are here in the ministry, and, and look at him. Look. He's like, no, Daddy. It's not who I'm called to. I know I can sing. I know I'm called to worship. And I'm always going to worship. But I'm called to young men. I'm called to young men. I'm called to mentor young men and to show them Jesus out there on the football field. That's what I'm supposed to do. So that's his world. By the grace of God, my brother David and his wife Lizzie, get a chance to reach and pour into the lives of multi-millionaires. Who gets a chance to reach those guys or those folks if you're not called to them? When you're called to them, the Lord opens doors and says, there you go. You're being obedient. I'm going to open these doors for you. Where is your mission field? We as a church, collectively, corporately, and I don't mean corporate in the sense of secular world and way of business, I mean, as a body, corporately, we have implemented missions as a part of our spiritual DNA. 
Mission Venecer was founded in 1959 by my grandparents in all Spanish. There was about 15 to 20 people that started this church in the projects of Harbor City over here. Didn't have a vision, didn't have a business plan. My grandfather, World War II vet, Mexican migrant, received Jesus at a crusade in Central California in San Jose. And when he gave his life to Jesus, he knew that God was calling him to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. When they started this church, it was with the idea that God has called us to missions, which is wherever you are, wherever you're planted, grow and tell all the world about Jesus Christ. My dad came back from Harvard in his, his studies back east in 1977, had just married my mom and decided that they wanted to raise their family. There was none yet by faith. They were going to raise their family right here in the neighborhood. And that's what they did. They said, Keystone is going to be our fishing pond. My mom and dad continued the ministry, you guys, right here in Keystone. And there are people, raise your hand if you're from Keystone area. Look at that, look at that, look at that. All over the place, many folks that we all grew up with lived on the same street. You live in, you live in Keystone? Oh, yeah, you're my brother, that's right. <laughs> it continues to be a part of the heartbeat of who we are. Missions. You want to be blessed as a, as a people? We have to continue to support our missionaries and be generous and give to those that have said yes some have, have left the, the comforts and confines of, of America and have gone to places to be uncomfortable, to be away from everything that they knew, everything that they loved, because they said yes to Jesus. Others have said, I'm, I'm called to missions right here in our own backyard, and I'm going to reach high school students on high school campus. That's going to be my mission field, and I'm going to make sure that I am able to reach as many youngsters as possible. We have high school missionaries in this place, don't we? Raise your hand, Brother Steve. Fellowship of Christian Athletes, San Pedro. He's the campus pastor over here in, at all the schools in Pedro. And we support Brother Steve and the, the Salgado family through our missions giving every month. Missions is here, at home, and away. Missions is wherever the people of God are wherever people are God is there and God is working and God is moving how many of you know what I'm talking about that's a blessing and we want to continue to do that here at Mission Ebenezer Family Church I remember when we started to emphasize missions and our ability to give financially in support to missionaries about 30 years ago Remember Pastor Danny? 30 years ago, Mission Ebenezer was down the street at the corner of Torrance and Maine, just on the other parcel of this big plot of land. And that's when we started doing the, the winter festivals to raise funds and raise awareness for missions so that we could take our missions support to another level. My dad had just come back from a missions conference at Dan Betzer's church in Lakeland, Florida. And at Dan Betzer's church, my dad was the keynote speaker and was talking about missions from a theological perspective and the responsibility and role of the church. And on the flight back from Florida, my father was thinking, man, that means we got our work cut out for us. We have to take our vision, our goals for missions to another level. I remember he came back so excited and so on fire and shared the vision here with Mission Ebenezer, Mission Ebenezer, and we caught the vision. I was a teenager. We caught the vision. Our youth were a part of catching the vision. Our children were a part of catching the vision so that we could support the work of Jesus Christ all around the world, even right here in our own backyard. And I want our church to continue to have the blessing of God and the favor of God upon us. I want God to bless every family that's a part of our church because we have continued to join in the efforts of this great body, of this great people, us Mission Ebenezerites. I know God wants to bless, 
And God desires the best. And he's doing that through you. Those four lepers looked to each other and said, it's not good what we're doing. Here we are, eating and drinking and having a merry old time. We must share what we've experienced and what we have received with others. So for us, I put it like this. You and I are simply one beggar telling another where to find the bread. One broken, lost, desperate, in need of salvation person. Letting another person who is broken and desperate and in need of salvation know where to find salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord.